In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We kneel or sit in confession. We take a moment of silence before our God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food 
and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and this is not your own being. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. We'd like to invite our young people forward for our children's message. Good morning. How are you today? Are you good? Was it hard getting up this morning? Oh, yeah, it was kind of hard. Well, I want to know if you have heard any good news lately. Have you heard any good news? How about the Chiefs won the Super Bowl? Is that good news? Is that good news? How about it's spring break? Yeah. Are you going to go anywhere on spring break? You don't know. To where? To the mall? Okay, that sounds fun. Well, I have some really, really good news today. In the Bible, which we know is the true word of God, it says in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. What does that mean? Why is that good news? Do you know why that's good news? You don't know. Okay. Well, who is God's son? Who's God's son? Jesus is God's son. And where did he live before he came to earth? Did he live in heaven? Yeah, he lived in heaven. Well, God knew that we had done some naughty things. We had sinned. And we would die in our sin if he didn't send Jesus. So God sent Jesus to the earth to be a a child just like you and to grow up. And one day, I have some bad news. 
they put Jesus on the cross, and they killed Jesus, and they punished Jesus for our sins, for the things we do wrong. And then I have some good news. What happened on Easter? He rose again, didn't he? He, went, he didn't stay dead. He came back to life. So God sent his son to die for us, but his son lives again. Is that good news? That's great news. Okay, can we say our prayer? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for us. And thank you for living for us. Help us to tell others the good news. Amen. Please stand as we sing the verse. gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God our Heavenly Father, you have sent your Son Jesus to take the sins of the world upon himself so that we might have eternal life. Keep us in this true faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. The New York Times has long been nicknamed the Gray Lady due to the thickness of the paper. It is the thickest paper in the United States, and as such, it makes it a good paper for those who like to read. But the New York Times has been failing, failing in readership, failing in revenue, failing in its prestige with having stories to be retracted or changed because the author leaves out pertinent facts. So to correct the ship, the editors decided to uh, devote the second and third pages of the paper not to important uh, articles, but to summaries of all the other articles that were in the paper. The change, they said, was made due to a couple of complaints. One is that readers just didn't have the time to read the full story. And two, that uh, the readers were complaining that um, the stories were so full that they often overlooked the ones they really cared about. But the change is really symptomatic of a larger trend. Social media has rewired our brain's reading ability. Part of the problem of the New York Times is that our, this change uh, has, um, not, has made people less tolerant of long articles. They have become skim readers rather than deep readers, um, hopping from story to story. They read maybe the first paragraph or two, and then they go to the next story or the next site. Skim reading, some have argued, is hurting our ability to think. Uh, everything is surface, quick, and hurried, uh, soundbite news. Quick reading doesn't capture the imagination. It doesn't allow for rich mental connections and doesn't allow people to grasp the fullness of the story. So this morning, we're going against that trend by doing a deep reading of John 3, 16. Now, while people probably don't have all of our texts on the tip of their tongues, almost all churchgoers can rattle off John 3.16, which is often called a gospel in the nutshell. But as one wag put it, the only thing that fits in a nutshell is a nut. But calling it the gospel in a nutshell... Uh, sort of gives the impression that if you know John 3.16, then you've got the whole of the Christian message, as if the rest of the Bible is just commentary. But our text today isn't 3.16. It starts at verse 14. And in that verse, Jesus makes an oblique reference to an Old Testament event our Old Testament lesson, in which he mentions about a, a bronze snake hanging on a pole. Now, the people who know John 3.16 probably have, haven't the foggiest idea of this story in the Old Testament. I mean, uh, they know John 3.16 that God loved the world, that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But what does a serpent on a pole have to do with Jesus dying on the cross? The quick reader, the skim reader, may think, oh, well, it's a serpent, so it must have to do with something in the garden in Eden. And they make the assumption that all serpents and snakes are uh, symbolic of Satan. But not in this case. This serpent is more healer, a savior of sorts. Think more along the line of the caduceus, you know, the snake around the pole that is the symbol for the medical profession. 
a deep reading of John 3.16 then allows us to have a deeper understanding of this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And it helps us more appreciate the revelation that Jesus is giving to us in this gospel lesson. So let's first then hyperlink to uh, Numbers. The book of Numbers is about the people of Israel failing, wandering away from God, breaking the first commandment, no other gods. Numbers is filled with the children of Israel's failures, complaining that they have no water, complaining that they have no food, complaining that it's taking too long, complaining that they have no meat, worshiping the pagan gods in the, from the lands through which they were passing, complaining that they hate manna. I mean, it had gotten so bad that they said, look, slavery in Egypt is better than being free in the wilderness. So let's look at Numbers 21. And in Numbers chapter 21, we find the people of Israel encamped in the wilderness, somewhere between Egypt and Canaan. As our text said, they had to skirt around the land of Eden because the Edomites would not let them pass through that land. And that made the people of Israel cranky. And they started complaining again. Oh, life was better in Egypt. We're going to die in this wilderness. And then in a rant that doesn't seem to make sense, we have no food or water and we hate the food that you've given to us. But, as the Old Testament lesson says, they not only complained against Moses, but now they were also complaining against God. Big mistake. To really understand what's going on or what happened here, then you got a deep read (laughs) to the beginning of Numbers then. And, And you'll discover in those stories that this isn't the first time that they had complained, nor was it the second time or the third time. This is at least the fourth time the Israelites had complained. And in the previous ones, God met their need. Water out of a rock, manna for food, quail for meat to eat. So they were going to act like children. You know, children understand that if they complain and get their way, hey, that's how to do it. They're going to complain again. If throwing a fit gets them what they want, they're going to throw a fit again. And so the children of Israel are back at it, complaining against God. But this time, God doesn't meet their need. He punishes them by sending poisonous snakes among them that were biting people and killing many, as the Old Testament lesson says. So this punishment brought the people quickly to their senses, to repentance, which is really what God wanted them to repent. They come to Moses and say, Moses, intervene before God that he will take these snakes away. Moses did. And God tells him to make a bronze snake, hang it on a pole, and lift it high so that anyone who was bitten may look to that snake and live. Now, unlike uh, internet readers who never return to the original source, let's go back to John 3. At the beginning of John 3, we find Nicodemus meeting secretly with Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, we are told. Pharisees were steeped in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, of which Numbers is one of those. When Jesus obliquely mentions this story of the serpents in the wilderness, Nicodemus would know exactly what story he is talking about, which, by the way, is a good reason to have your children and you as adults in Sunday school, because it's there that you learn these stories so that you can make these rich connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Anyway, 
Nicodemus is meeting with Jesus to discover and understand his mission and his message. When Jesus tells Nicodemus, just as the serpent was lifted in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life, Nicodemus could use that story and go, oh, I get it. I understand what Jesus' mission is. He has come to be a healer, a savior. Now, granted, Nicodemus may not have known that Jesus was going to die on the cross, be lifted up in that way, but Nicodemus is beginning to grasp the mission of Jesus. Just as the people who were bitten because of their sin in the wilderness could look to the bronze snake and live, so everyone who is bitten by the poisonous snake of sin can look to Jesus and believe and live. Knowing that story then also helps us understand Jesus' words right after John 3.16. Jesus says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The number, in numbers, the live snakes were an agent of God's judgment. But here, Jesus tells Nicodemus the difference between his mission and the role of the snakes in the wilderness. Jesus came not to be the biting snakes of judgment and death. Jesus came to be the bronze snake. He can, he can, he, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Not to kill, but to heal. Granted, those that uh, refuse to look to Jesus as those who refuse to look to the snake then will die from the venom of sin. But condemnation was not Jesus' mission. Saving people from the venom of sin was Jesus' mission. That's why when we read John 3.16, we need to be more than just decoders of information. We need to see the richness of what Jesus is telling us so that we too may appreciate the depth that God went to to save us from our sins. We need to make those rich mental connections between the Old and the New Testament. The connection that we can make today is to see how we are a lot like the children of Israel. When things are going well, we kind of take credit for that. But we know in this world things don't go well for long. Soon we meet troubles and trials. And more than likely we seek out a human solution rather than looking for God's guidance and solution. And when we look for the human solution, it only gets us deeper into trouble. And then we start complaining, complaining that God has abandoned us, that God has forgotten us, complaining that God isn't doing anything about this situation, when really it's our foolishness, our weakness, our failings, that have gotten us into this trouble. But where we fail, Jesus doesn't fail. Like God's unfailing love for his people of Israel, Jesus has unfailing love for you as well. The healing that Jesus brought by being lifted up on the pole of the cross heals us of our sin sickness, our deep rebellion, our deep failures. Looking to Jesus on the cross, believing in Jesus' sacrifice for us, heals us because we see the one who can save. He is God in the flesh. 
And he has taken on himself on that cross the sins of the world and given us in return the balm of forgiveness, the anti-venom to sin. Reading a deep reading of John 3.16 enables us to hear this text the way Nicodemus heard it. Jesus has come to be a healer from sin. It also helps us understand God's constant love for a constantly failing people, the central theme of Scripture. Story after story assures us that though we fail, God's love never fails. There's only one thing we must not fail to do. Look to Jesus and live. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand to make confession of the faith that we share with one another in our triune God by speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we do gather our tithes and offerings and worship for our Lord. We invite you to bring those forward and place them in our offering plates. And if you have your attendance card filled out, we also invite you to bring those forward and place those in our offering plates. We worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings.
Please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you had lifted Moses high, had Moses lift high the bronze serpent in the wilderness, thereby foreshadowing your own son's lifting up on the cross. Teach us to hear in the Old Testament the promises and pictures of the coming Christ, who is their Savior and ours. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> o Lord God, draw us into your light. Expose whatever we, like your old people of the Old Testament, have thought, spoken, and acted against you, that in repentance we might look to your Son, lifted up on the cross, and be saved from your righteous wrath. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Bless the work of all missionaries as they carry out this gospel to the ends of the earth, especially the mission work with our partners in Tanzania and the Nelsons in India and Kendall and Samantha in Hungary, that many may hear of your love in Christ Jesus and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, you are the, our light and our salvation. Hide in your shelter Dan Baczynski, Joanne Campbell, Scott Roberts, Carrie Taylor, Emily Tingle, and all who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Keep them in their day of trouble from falling into faithless fear and uphold them with your peace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, and praying as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. By patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace.